What's the word, y'all? We are in the dead of the offseason, man. It's always a very real spot for me. Uh, there's probably not going to be many trades, many signings, or anything like that. We just kind of chilling until training camp. And I always try to use this time every single season to reflect on my previous year as far as the covers that I did, making content, me as a fan, and all of the other stuff. And I always want to get better. I want every single season to be a better experience for myself, which means a better experience for you as a viewer, right? And, and part of my reflecting and going through all of the videos that I made during the 2023-2024 season, I feel like I didn't have a lot of fun or well, I had a lot of fun, but like fun type of videos that mean nothing. I feel like all of my videos were high stakes or nothing. Oh my God, so-and-so got traded. Here's my opinion about it. And while those videos are obviously very important to this channel, I feel like we've been missing just randomness. So today we're trying something I've been wanting to do for some time, but I, I've been, I haven't done it because I'm a little bit afraid of Adam Silver. Adam Silver can cut this all off like that. So Adam, if you're watching, please let me test this out. Let me explain what we're doing, y'all. Right here, I have a wheel of all 30 NBA teams. And here, I got a wheel from every year between the year 2000 and 2024. We're going to spin both wheels. And whatever team and whatever year we land on, we're going to dive into that team in that year, whether that be watching full games, highlights, just kind of reminiscing about different uh, portions of NBA teams. And the reason we did 2000, because I always, I want the footage to at least be, okay, we start going back to the 90s, and if it wasn't a Jordan-led Bulls team, all of the footage is awful. At least in the 2000s, it started to change a little bit. Okay, so uh, I also want to do this because anybody can name the best teams from 2007, right? But I feel like though those middle of the pack teams, even the bad teams kind of get lost in the shuffle, and I don't want to do that. I want to just like go through memory lane and remember some old stuff that I might have forgot. Remember when so-and-so played on this team in 2009 and dropped 23 against the Lakers? Just random stuff. All right, let's get into it. Let's start off to see what year we're going to. I want it to be in the past, and we're going to... to, to it's one of the oldest places you could go, which is 2001. Now, 2001 is a very interesting year for me. My first year of NBA fandom is 2003. But, of course, with me doing my history throughout the course of my life, I know a lot about 2001, what the rosters look like, the champions, and all of that type of stuff. So, let's figure out what team we get. We get the 2001... Wow. Philadelphia 76ers. This is elite because this team went to the NBA championship and lost to the LA Lakers. By, okay, this is a great, great start because I was a little bit afraid, even though, again, I would have accepted the fact that we got a 15-win team, I was a little bit afraid for it to be in the potential pilot episode for it to be somebody that was awful. This team's got Allen Iverson. That's fun. So I think we start off here. Basketball reference is the place you need to be, right? So this team ended up 56-26 and 26 to start the season or to finish the season. Larry Brown is the coach. They were the 13th ranked offense, but the fifth ranked defense. And that's pretty impressive when you consider Allen Iverson being on the roster. Not, I mean, AIS led the league in steals a bunch of different times, but he's a smaller guard and he was, you know, overmatched physically in a lot of cases. So the fact that they were such a better defense than offense is something I didn't even know, even though, again, I know a lot about this team. They went against the Pacers in the first round, got rid of them in four. Then you got the Toronto Raptors, went seven. And I think this is the infinite, infamous Vince Carter game, right? Yes, it is. If y'all don't know the story, Vince Carter was graduating from UNC and um, he decided on this game, the day of the game seven to take a flight to, to cross the stage and get his diploma, then fly back for the game, which was in Philadelphia. And Raptors fans at the time were not very happy with that. And when you pair it with the fact that he ended up shooting six for 18 on the day. It just kind of changed the perspective of Vince for a little bit. I think one of my favorite things we could do in this series is go through like the archives. So this is ESPN.com from 2001. It's just frozen in time, which is magnificent. Um, and it talks about Toronto Raptors star squeezed and attending graduation ceremony in North Carolina before game Sunday's game seven of the Raptors playoff series versus the 76ers and left himself open for criticism about whether the last minute travel was a distraction. Yeah, we talked about something that was 23 years ago, so I don't I, I don't have an opinion about this, um, but I thought I remember at the time it being a, a big story. I do think this is interesting, basically saying that um, Lenny Wilkins, who was the coach at the time, he basically warned Vince Carter, like, bro, if you get on that plane, you go to North Carolina, and if you you play bad in game seven, you're gonna get criticized for it. And V C was like, well, I don't care. I'm Vince Carter. I probably won't play bad. Well, you know how that goes. Um, and then he had some teammates that didn't really comment. They said they didn't have a problem, but they didn't comment. Interesting part is that he didn't actually get his diploma. It was, it was mailed. So he basically went there to across the stage, which I can understand it being a big moment, especially, I don't know what his history was, but I remember when my sister graduated college, 
it, she was the first in our family to do that. So it was a big moment. We were all there for that. I don't, again, I don't know his situation. Maybe he was, maybe he wasn't. But I understand the sentimental value of being the first to do something, if that is the case. And if you have a college degree, you know, in a lot of cases, you got to work your butt off to get it. So again, I understand it. But that's not, we're not talking about Vince Carter, but I feel like that's what these videos could turn into. Anyway, so they beat uh, the Toronto Raptors in the game seven. And this is just crazy how these times have gone. It was 88 to 87. And if I'm not mistaken, see, look, see, look. Now, I used to be kind of like this historian with this type of stuff. Let me double check to before I say this. Yeah. Okay. So it was the Eric Snow, Aaron McKee games down the stretch. Um, we're five minutes left. Eric Snow makes some free throw. He missed the second one. AI misses one. Uh, they get a rebound, a call timeout. They drop a play that ends up with Eric Snow hitting the two. The Aaron McKee hits back-to-back -back buckets. Uh, Antonio Davis hits one from three feet out. Dale Curry, old man Dale Curry hits a three to put it within one. And then Vince Carter got the last shot and ended up missing it. And you know what? I never actually watched the last shot that Vince Carter got in this series. So let's 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 react to it live. Well, not live. Again, it's 23 years later. But let's react to the type of look that he got with two seconds to go. Oh, he got hey, he got him up in the air. That's the shot he that's the shot he can make. You're not mad at the actual attempt. He got whoever the defense, I mean the, the footage is so fuzzy. <laughs> he got whoever that was up in the air. Got a good look and missed it. Funny enough, the top comment on this video is talking about Kawhi Leonard getting a similar shot against the 76ers in a game seven and hitting it. Um, kind of crazy parallels. Anyway, and then they go to a game seven versus the Bucks. And this Bucks team has, they have Ray Allen. Um, and Ray Allen had a 38 point game in this series. Sam Cassell had 24. Big Dog has 22. In this series, AI struggles from the field, but still averages 30. Ray Allen averages 27, five and three in the series, 50% from three, and he attempted 55 throughout the series, which seems like a low number, but again, we're talking about 2001. So that's a that's a really high number given the, um, the time frame. He shot 51% on those threes in this series, which is crazy. Um, phenomenal series for him. And this goes game seven, and the 76 is blowing out in game seven. They got to triple digits. And it usually was a race to triple digits. Ray Allen, like he had a really good game in this one as far as counter stats go. Big Dog also put up 24 in San Paseo. So they had their big three going. Irvin Johnson plays 41 minutes and only scores two points. That's five fouls. And then Darvin Ham score, uh, played eight minutes. Okay, Tim Thomas played a lot of this game. But on the other side of things, you end up seeing AI with 44 in the closeout game. Wow. Wow, AI. 44 in the closeout game. Aaron McKee with 13 assists. Dikembe with seven. Oh, Dikembe, seven blocks, 19. Re he almost had a 2020 game with 23, po 23 points, 19 rebounds, seven blocks. See, this is a game that I feel like I should watch. You got a very good Ray Allen game. You got 44 from Allen Iverson. And you got Dikembe Mutombo holding it down. I'm putting it on a list of things we should watch. But obviously, they get to the finals. They play against this legendary Lakers team. And this Lakers team lost one game the entire playoff run. And that game was game one. Everybody knows that, that famous game from Allen Iverson where he hits the shot, steps over Tyron Lue, and he ends up with 48. Again, the fact that this man led this team to the finals is one thing. We put a 44 in the closeout game versus the Bucs and then take a, a, drops 48 against this dominant all-time team and takes a game. It's just special stuff. Um, so we all know Allen Iverson. He was my favorite, my first favorite player of all time. In this series, five gamer, he, he averages 35. On the other side, there was no Shaquille O'Neal answer. Even though in 2001, the Kimbe Mutombo, he won DPOY, he still was no match for a prime Shaquille O'Neal. And Shaq ends up averaging 33, 16, and five with three blocks. Kobe, this is a 22-year-old Kobe, 24, eight, and six. Ridiculous, ridiculous times, bro. The, um, the Kimba in the series looked like he held his own statistically where he was averaging 16 and 12. Uh, but I'm assuming he was in a lot of foul trouble this whole series guarding Shaq. I mean, AI was the leading scorer in every single game except for game two, which Kobe took. Kobe had 31 and Allen Iverson only had 23 on 29 shots. So that was his maybe his worst game in this entire playoff run. But I, I want to take a step back. Because um, this team had some players, right? Tony Kukoc was on the roster. I don't know what happened. Oh, he got traded halfway through a part of the Dikembe Mutombo trade. Okay. All right. Because I, I do remember him being on his roster, but I don't remember him playing in the playoffs. He was a part of the trade with Nazi, Muhammad, Theo Ratliff, and Pepe. Oh, Pepe Sanchez's name I ain't heard in a long time. Um, 
for Dikembe and Roshan McLeod, a name that I don't recognize at all. He only played 100 games in the association. Um, so, okay, that, ma- that makes sense that Tony Kukoc wasn't here. Uh, but you, you could have used him, but you did get Dikembe. Dikembe is a DPOY, so I understand it. It is also, this is a video I'm going to do in the future, I believe, about how trades are so different now compared to the past. Because Dikembe, again, won DPOY. And they traded him with Nazi Muhammad, who had a long NBA career. 2001, he's uh, a 23-year-old with some promise and upside, who averaged 12 and, and 9, right, when he got to Atlanta. And they traded him also with Theo Ratliff. And Theo, in 2001, was just an all-star. So, the, oh, it was an all-star for all-star trade. But the, the Atlanta Hawks got Tony Kukoc and a young Nazi Muhammad. That's very interesting to me. That's very, very interesting to me. I'm going to look at some articles about that because I want to know what the perception of the trade was. And here we go back with the archive. Oh, this is so elite. So Allen Iverson was a huge advocate for this trade. I'd be lying to you if I didn't say this guy can help us win a championship. He's a rebounder. He's an intimidator. He can change the game all by himself offensively and defensively. It's going to be tough for guys to double team him and myself. So it's so interesting to see the general perception of the Kimbe Mutombo. Everybody recognizes that he's one of the best defensive players of all time with the finger wag and all all of that. I think that might get lost in the shuffle that he was widely considered a good offensive player too, even if he was averaging only 13 points per, or in this season, 10 points per game. I wonder what his screen assists look like. Boom. See, this is a part of history that would have been lost if I had find this article. Uh, Brown said the trade will fill a short-term hole left by an injured Theo Ratliff. So Theo Ratliff was injured this year. So this was a flyer, not even a flyer, because again, Theo was an all-star, but the Atlanta Hawks maybe do a little bit of a reset, get a young Nazi Muhammad, they get an injured Theo Ratliff, so he probably comes back next season, right? And then he's better for us. Um, oh, never mind. It says two to four weeks. Let's see what he actually ended up missing. He missed the entire rest of the season. Um, so there we go. So they didn't trade Theo because they didn't like Theo or whatever, whatever. It was just the fact that he might miss 12 to 20 games. And again, we just saw that he missed the rest of the season. I don't know. That could have been just because they wanted to sit him out. That could have been the, the injury ended up lasting longer. But they took it. They couldn't have that on a uh, prime Allen Iverson team. They needed somebody that contribute right now. And they got him, of course, to match up against Shaquille O'Neal, whose name is spelled wrong in an ESPN article. Huh. Shaquille O'Neal. Uh, David Robinson, Arvita Sabonis, and Vladi Diva. So yeah, the Western Conference had a bunch of centers, and you knew you was going to see one of them, and it'll be a Shaq. So this is the Game 7 versus the Milwaukee Bucks. Um, and every time I go back to watch old footage and everything, I'm amazed at how much the game has evolved from the spacing aspect, from the defensive aspect, to how everybody defends differently. There's a the Dikembe Mutombo shot hook. Um, hook. Everything is just so much different. And that's why I hate trying to compare errors because it's not the same game. Nothing about it is the same other than the objective of putting the ball in the hole. But look at that. There's zero. Like, no way in, in today's game of basketball where Allen Iverson, the mo- one of the three most lethal scorers in all of basketball, is able to get this screen from Dikembe. And who is this? Is this Eldon Johnson? That might be Eldon Johnson. And Eldon Johnson doesn't show at least a little bit. Zero percent chance that this will happen in today's game, but they take advantage of it. And Allen Iverson finds a lot of space here because I think Ray Allen does a good job of getting around that. But he finds an open spot, and it's Allen Iverson, baby. He's that open. He gonna knock it down. Ray Allen, you know what? That was cash again. That man does not miss. Oh man, I'm I'm having flashbacks. Hey, okay, Big Dog. Some players throughout history, I know, like again, Big Dog Glenn Robinson. I may have seen actual a full game of Glenn Robinson play basketball maybe twice in my entire life. So, like, I can recognize how good a player is without knowing what type of archetype of a player he was. So this is actually cool to see the type of jump shots or finishes that he gets. Tyron Hill is getting post touches. And, I mean, if you're going to get it, you're going to get it, Hill. Get you one. And they're going to Allen Iverson with Sam Cassell because Sam Cassell is just a bigger body. That's that's going to traverse every era. You're going to take advantage of the small man on the court. And you're seeing a lot of that from a lot of, oh my God, from a lot of people. I mean, they're putting Allen Iverson in every single action. Again, same thing would happen in today's game. Here's another one. Get, they get a switch. Robinson is just bigger. So, And that's when I said earlier that it was a surprise to me that they were still the fifth best defense. Where like when you get to a point like this, in the end, they've made the NBA Finals. Where other teams are going to try to pick on you, pick on you, pick on you. 
And not only did Allen Iverson compete on both on, on the defensive end, he also was dropping 40 while competing defensively. Oh my God, what a misdirection. Oh my God, Sam. Oh my God, Sam, hold on. Because I'm 100% thinking that pass is going right here. Wow. Everybody does, even, even Tyrone, Tyrone. That's why he's not looking at the damn ball. He's looking at the man coming off the screen. That's a beautifully placed place pass, Sam. This is what I mean by competing, though. Like, he's, he's six foot even on a good day. Competes for that, goes coast to coast. And one of the reasons AI said that he wore all of this on his arms and stuff is because underneath that was bumps and bruises of him just fighting, 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 fighting. 12-2 run to take that lead back. That's impressive. Oh, my God, that's such a tough look, AI. Such a tough look, man. Uh-oh, get another one. Well, what is a one more when you're Allen Iverson? What is a one more when you're Allen Iverson? In this half, Rajah Bell, we've, I've watched him dunk the ball twice, get this and one, and hit a three. This is a rookie Rajah Bell in a game seven. That's huge, bro. Again, we know we know the outcome. They win this game and go to the finals. But, like, I didn't recognize that Rajah was contributing that much in the NBA playoffs as a rookie. You want to know what makes this even crazier? Again, we talked about Rajah Bell putting up a couple double-digit points in game seven, right? This is about to blow your mind. Raja Bell played in the regular season a total of five games in the regular season. Again, 2000, this is Rick. He played five, he played 30 total minutes his rookie regular season. Got to the playoffs and, and ended up playing 15 games, eight minutes per game, right? That's what I was tripping. I didn't know he was contributing at all because look at this game law. It's like, I don't, I got to look at Raja Bell's history, but he signed to the team the last month of the season or something. And then he plays a little bit here, one minute, two minute garbage time. And then boom, game, game six, 16 minutes, eight points. Game seven, eight minutes, 10 points. And then in the finals, he also played 18 minutes, 19 minutes. So I got to look at the Raja Bell story now. So Raja played in the CBA, the Continental Basketball Association, where he made an all rookie team. Then he signed with the Spurs in 20, uh, 2000 but never play for them. He eventually was released and then signed two 10-day contracts with the 76ers in April. That's insane. So he was off the street, 10-day contract, and then eventually, a month later, playing in the Game 7 in the Eastern Conference Finals, dropping 10. That's, what a story. Then eventually, you know, he ended up making two all-defensive teams, 2007-2008, Raja Bell, that's a, that's a story I didn't know about Raja, so I'm, I'm glad that we hear. I don't know, maybe I'm just a nerd about stuff like this, but I, again, through the ESPN archives, um, found something about the TV ratings of game number one. A thrilling game one of the two NBA Finals reversed the league's sagging TV ratings. The 76ers 107-105 upset of the Los Angeles Lakers in overtime Wednesday night drew a 15.2 overnight rating on NBC. NBC currently has the rights going after next season again, and I love the uh, the NBC's production and everything. I hope they bring that back. That's 17 or 19 percent higher than the overnight number for the Lakers' 17 point victory over the Pacers in Game One of last season. So this is just like the Lakers have been so dominant that they were afraid that they'd never really get some really good Raiders again because well, why would you tune in to watch the Lakers dominate, dominate, dominate? And with the 76 is taking this game and kind of change some things. Again, obviously we know what the rest of the series look like, a lower verse sweepy sweep. But still, that's 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 pretty good. This is a, a preview by Peter May back in 2001 before the NBA Finals of him, you know, talking through the series. And I thought this sentence was interesting. Talking about the Lakers, they have the aura of champions. I know there's more to the sentence, but I'm just... Aura, of course, has been in the dictionary for a long time, but it's in 2024, 2023 to 24, it's just, it's just become more prevalent now. I just thought that was funny. Again, one of my favorite things is going back and rereading articles from, from, um, from writers back in the day because I, I, I want to kind of paraphrase these last couple um, paragraphs, right? Matter of fact, I'll, I'll read some of this verbatim. It was interesting to watch the 76ers after their big win Sunday and all the uh, attended hoopla. We now are in the age of instant celebration, instant recognition, and instant gratification. That sounds like something current people are saying in 2024, right, gang? This is 2001. We have the obligatory fireworks before every game. We have confetti and streamers released in buildings when a team wins a single playoff game. We had the same Sunday, we had the same Sunday night along with the attendant hat shirts signifying the, sig the Sixers conference crown. 
we can't imagine the 1980s Lakers or Celtics, again, that's my dyslexia, mixing those two words, doing that. Can't you just envision Bird wearing a hat signifying he's a conference champion? But times have changed in the NBA, and we had to, yada, yada, yada. Again, it's just interesting to see because I, I feel like I've seen this exact uh, this exact argument on Twitter like two days ago. And they were saying it in 2001. You talk about how history repeats itself, repeats itself, repeats itself. Nothing really ever changes. An example right here. Sheesh. Hey, uh, wait, wait, wait. Who is this author again on this writer? Peter May. I, I hope that Peter May is still writing somewhere because he's dropping. He's dropping stuff, bro. Winning the Eastern Conference title this year is like winning the New Hampshire pr pr primary. You'll get to Bean for one night, and you'll get the buzz for a day or two. Then you realize what lies ahead. Basically saying that the, like, um, okay, this is p political, so I probably won't go too far into it. But he's basically showcasing that the Eastern Conference in this time is basically the way we've seen the Eastern Conference in real life over the last couple of years. Again, the Celtics won this year, so it, it's kind of flipped, where the Easter Conference returned the weaker conference, and whoever's coming out west is probably going to win the championship, right? LeBron and them was dominating on the Easter Conference team, but was it really good because the Easter Conference sucked? Regardless, that's how, what he's saying, too. This East, there was no team out in the Easter Conference that can match up with whether they had been the Sacramento Kings, whether they had been the Spurs, or, of course, the most dominant team of the era, the 2001 Lakers. You can celebrate all you want, but you do have to face... The Lakers. And that's that's dope. It looks like Peter May has not written an article since 2021. It doesn't make me feel great. Uh, okay, but he did tweet like two months ago. Okay, I don't know. I, I, I never want to assume nothing, but he did tweet like two months ago. He's probably just out of the business of writing. Because again, his ass look old in this picture I'm looking at from 2000, <laughs> 2001. So yeah, he's probably retired, which is dope. And this entire article, he's basically praising the 76ers though. Um, and, and talks about his fear that if the Milwaukee Bucks would have won this series, that when they went against the LA Lakers, that they would have a deer in the headlights type of mindset, or, or um, that's what it would seem like. And he knew that the 76ers will not be that because of the monster, the six foot monster that is at the guard position in Allen Iverson. So it's a really dope article from 2001, and I really enjoyed watching, uh, reading it, even though, again, it's 23 years later. I got some more lore about this season that is unbelievable that I, I didn't notice. Like, again, someone that prides themselves on knowing random NBA stuff, I had no idea that right before the 2000-2001 season, Larry Brown walked into the office with Billy King and said, I'm tired of Allen Iverson being late. I'm tired of him back-talking me. You need to trade him. And they had a trade. Think, I mean, Allen Iverson went on to win MVP this season and led his team to the finals. And to think that he was about to be traded to the Detroit Pistons is insane to me. And the only reason he did not get traded is because Matt Meager was guaranteed some money with a 15% a pay raise with a trade kicker. And in order for the trade to go through, he would have had to waive that. And he said, no, bring me my money. This trade was a 16-24 player trade. <laughs> 24 players um, and again that just shows you how ridiculous trades were back then where a guy like Allen Iverson who would go on to win an MVP award that nobody, no draft picks just straight vibes and players so the 76ers would have walked out with Eddie Jones, Glenn Rice and Jerome Williams who knows what else was going to go where but all we know is that Allen Iverson was this close to being a part of the Detroit Piston and, and I don't know like the domino for my personal life is crazy because of Matt Meager the reason you watching this video is because of Matt Meager, bro. My dyslexia won this battle. Matt Meager is MMG. Matt Geeger is an NBA player or former NBA player. I keep saying Matt Meager. Shout out to my boy MMG, but that's not... MMG is not the reason I love basketball. <laughs> it's Matt Geeger. Because my first memory is watching Allen Iverson versus Jamal Crawford on the, when he was on the 76 in 2003. So if Allen Iverson is not on that 76 team, when I load in to, to watch WGN, do I care about basketball? Yeah, I do. My uncle is a, is a hoop head. But, like, do I care about it enough to want it to be my life? I don't know. All because of Matt Meager said, no, I will not wave my... Oh, man. And this is a piece of history that I would have never known if I wasn't still digging. Uh, so I just, turned, I just started caring back on... All right, whatever. And I guess I'm not, I'm not watching this right now. It's a full one-hour documentary about the 2001 76ers. 
that I didn't know exist. It's on Apple Music, I mean, Apple, but it's also here on YouTube the, in its entirety. So, I mean, if you really want the deep dive into the year, I'm 100% going to watch this eventually. It's just not happening at this moment in time. But it's like you got sit down, sit down some Theo Ratliff, Alan Iverson, Aaron McKee. So it's got every, it's got, it seems like the people that played a huge part. So yeah, this is actually the type of stuff I would love to do. It's even got Stephen A. Smith, who was covering the 76 at this time. Um, Stephen A. Smith started off as a writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer. So he was around Alan Iverson a ton during this era. And he'll talk to, talk about it any chance you, you get him to. Um, so it's interesting that he's a part of this documentary too, because he, you know, was here for this time in real time. Wow, I did not know this existed, but it's now in my watch later. Got it. Hey, um, I think that's a good place to end it. We've been going for like an hour and some change. I think we learned a lot today. Um, and I feel like there's still so much more we can learn about this specific team. It's a very good story. If you if you enjoyed this, let me know by just leaving a like. If we turn this into something, maybe I need to figure out a name for it. I had a lot of fun. Hopefully you did too.